Welcome back, and thanks for joining us on Go Open. I will be as patronizing as possible as long as I believe it will build our viewership, which is really quite good. So thank you so much for all your support. Uh, open source, fantastic idea. Television, an even better idea, where through some sort of illusion, I can't see you, but you can see me. Hello, ma'am. Okay, good. So um, stick around, you can win some fantastic prizes, which we know will make you keep watching, because you get something for nothing, and that's how people work. Go Open. Open source software exists as a result of the combined efforts of millions of computer programmers, users and software vendors from around the world. They share their intellectual property freely and they believe that software should cost nothing and should enrich the lives of users. Open source software is the alternative and biggest challenger to closed source or proprietary software. It generally costs the user nothing. It can be distributed freely to anyone. Download it, use it, modify it, and give it away. It's a whole new world. Open source is the future of computing. The business of searching for information has become the internet's killer app, which is short for application. Basically, that's geek speak for the coolest thing since sliced bread. Uh, we're not sure what was the coolest thing before sliced bread. We think it might have been bread, or it may have been something that we don't even know what it was, but it was sliced. So we're not sure, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but Google has... Um, has made an enormous business using open source. On the 18th of August, when Google listed on the NASDAQ, it made international headlines because of its phenomenal growth to a value of $30 billion. This company doesn't sell anything physical, but 80% of web users are clued up enough to use Google when they need to do a search. It was quite weird when Google started out. It was kind of, it just appeared on the scene because there were a number of search engines around. And it was, Basically, they sort of suddenly said, okay, we are now the search engine. According to Wikipedia, the raw computing power harnessed by Google makes it the most powerful supercomputer known to humankind. Running at speeds in the region of 300 teraflops, Google's grid computer runs three times faster than the Earth simulator. The thing about this, the speed part is traditionally what you do is take a very large computer and you would load the information into the computer and do a search on it and then give the results to people. Um, the problem with that is that if lots of people come along and hit your site, generally you've got to start adding a hell of a lot of these very big computers in order to do the job. And very big computers come at large price tags. So where they started to innovate was to get high performance out of very low powered machines. Google started out in 1996 as a university research project. Two PhD students, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, worked out that a search engine based on a mathematical analysis of the relationships between websites would produce better results than other search engines on the web at the time. The essential ingredient in the Google ranking system is to observe that pages that have got lots of links going to them are more likely to be relevant and interesting than pages that have few links going to them. This was their insight and the basis of their first ranking algorithm. Google is now estimated to have more than 60,000 linked computers. The main thing that they need lots of computers for is the processing tasks that are involved in keeping the Google database of web pages up to date. The technology behind Google's search algorithm is a closely guarded secret. If you're someone who's trying to make your website or your company's website appear higher up in the Google rankings, then if you know exactly how Google's doing that ranking, you can tweak your website in special ways so that it, it comes higher up the rankings. One thing we do know about Google is how it finds things on the web. You wouldn't think that the World Wide Web employs spiders to help you, but they're not as hairy and scary as this one. Google's server farm has more than 60,000 Linux computers all running spiders called Googlebots. When the spider finds a page, it collects the data on that page and sends it back home to Google, where it's stored in a vast cache that pretty much replicates the internet on their machines. This keeps the Google database up to date, so when you do a search, the whole of the web has been crawled for you. Back at the end of the 90s, what made Google stand out from all the other search engines was how good it was at ranking the result pages according to their relevance. So, for example, if you type Johannesburg into Google these days, uh, there are something like three million pages that Google thinks are kind of related to Johannesburg. But the top ten that you get are, on the whole, very relevant. In total, there are around nine and a half billion web pages, images and Usenet messages in the Google index. And this figure is growing every day. 
Listed now as one of the biggest technology companies on America's NASDAQ stock exchange, Google makes a large portion of its money through highly targeted advertising. If you hit the Google website with, with a query, what it'll do is effectively two searches. The one is a search that you're looking for. The second query is to search for advertising that it might be of relevance to you. Um, basically those two together, the one's effectively financing the other one. But given the sheer size of Google's computer needs, it simply wouldn't be able to exist without open source software. If you've got an enormous amount of machines, the software, that the building blocks and all of those machines, is going to add up to an enormous amount of money. Google wouldn't really be possible without, without open source software. With a mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, Google remains first prize for 80% of people searching for anything. Our guest this week, our big gun, is a fantastic man. He's the founder of a thing called Creative Commons, which is kind of like the um, open source for intellectual property, but particularly for music. And he's a lawyer. I know, I know, but he's lovely. Uh, here's Larry Lessig. Professor, thank you for, thank you for joining us uh, on Go Open. Let's, let's dive straight into it. Record companies, the big ones, have said that MP3s hurt their bottom line. There's been no independent study of MP3s that demonstrate any substantial harm that they're causing to the record companies. In fact, in Europe, record sales go up even though record, uh, MP3 downloads also go up. So I think that we should step away from the kind of war rhetoric that the record labels have uh, spun around this and be a little bit more balanced and reasonable in understanding how this potential for peer-to-peer -peer file sharing could actually be the beginning of a brand new industry. But what's bizarre to me is that policymakers in the United States and more bizarrely internationally are so quick to buy this totally predictable party line on behalf of a very small number of uh, record companies. Now authors and uh, musicians, producers who go under Creative Commons, do they now have uh, to say equal legal protection using Creative Commons? They have absolutely the same legal protection. Both Creative Commons and traditional copyright builds on top of the property rights called copyright that the law gives the author. The difference between the two is that the Creative Commons license marks the content with the freedom that the author intends the content to carry. A lot of record companies would say they deserve most of that copyright. If you release uh, music uh, under a non-commercial license that permits people to share the music but not to sell it, and your uh, uh, music then becomes famous and loved around the world, then record labels will seek you out to be able to find and sign you up for a, a record contract so that you can begin to sell your music internationally. Once an artist uh, perhaps is ready to go to that big record company, a lot of people say that those record companies are trying to take away that individual's copyright companies around the world have increasingly insisted that authors have to sign away all of their rights before they have any right to uh, participate in the distribution system that these publishers have created. So uh, musicians in the United States face this all the time. In order to release their record, they're going to have to sign away so many other records to this one label. And if it turns out they're not a success, according to the label, the label won't free them to do their work elsewhere. And one of the things we hope Creative Commons will do will be to revive this ideal that it's authors who should control what happens to their creative work. But what I oppose is the idea that the law should reinforce one particular way to distribute content and disable all the other potential ways that could compete with that. Mr. Lessig, thank you so much for joining us here at Go Open. Yeah, very nice to be here. Coming up after the break, a special feature on e-commerce. Very exciting. Uh, plus, we meet a lady hacker. <laughs> and of course, don't forget our competition, which will give you the chance to win really big. E-commerce is an idea way ahead of its time. When we first found e-commerce, many people said it would never work. Uh, and it did fail when the internet bubble burst. But for those people who believed it would never work, we have one word for you. And that word is Amazon.com. Ah yes, and now in South Africa, open source is allowing a lot of people to open up a lot of opportunities and make them open, uh, like gifts or books or your mind, they're not much use unless you open them. 
I've just finished ordering my groceries at Pick and Pay online. The magic of e-commerce is that it's safe, secure, and I get to go shopping without actually going shopping. Pick and Pay and other retailers have been offering their clients a service whereby they order and pay for their groceries online and have them delivered within a few days. For customers, it means greater convenience. For the retailer, there are benefits too. For them, in the long term, it should uh, cut a lot of their costs of uh, selling. They don't need physical stores, uh, typically. They don't need the same level of physical branding that is pretty expensive. And they also have a direct relationship with the customer. Online, you know exactly what they're looking at. According to internet guru Arthur Goldstadt, e-commerce can be broken into two main groups, B2B, or business to business, and B2C, or business to consumer. In the business to consumer group, we see the market dominated by a few key players. South Africa's most popular online uh, retailers are Pick and Pay Online and Kalahari.net. They probably account for more than half of all online retail sales in this country. But some small businesses are making inroads, like loot.co.za, who are providing a fresh approach to a tried and trusted formula. We saw a niche for, actually at the time, um, providing discount technical books, and we started um, investigating in that and doing our research in that regard. But we fa fairly soon realized that the type of system that we needed to sell 10,000 technical books or the type, sort of system that we needed to sell a million plus um, general books was, there wasn't much difference. To start a company like this using proprietary software would be prohibitively expensive. Michael opted for open source. Open source products are absolutely reliable. We, re we depend on them for mission critical applications. We've never had a problem with our database. We've never had a problem with Linux. We've never had a problem with, um, with Java or our uh, servlet engine. So we find them to be absolutely reliable. And if we, when, we, when we have run into problems, we've always been able to resolve them fairly quickly because the amount of knowledge out there on these products um, on the, that's freely accessible on the internet is, is vast. We've all heard stories about credit card fraud over the internet. But is this just a myth? Our impression is that customers are most concerned about security of credit card. And when you pay using a credit card on our site, we make it clear to the customer that it's a secure transaction. We encrypt our um, transaction with SSL using a thought certificate. And we also give the customers the option of not storing their card details in our database at all, which means that if our database were to be hacked, which we're very confident that it will never be, um, but even if it were to be hacked, um, an intruder still wouldn't be able to get hold of their car details. Do South Africans spend a lot of time and money online? No, South Africans don't spend as much time uh, shopping online as, for example, Americans. They spend a lot less money and a lot less time. And the reason for that is simple. Our, con our connections are just too slow. And the online experience is very poor compared to in the United States. There are three and a half million people with internet access in South Africa, but only 250,000 of those do online shopping. That's not a very big audience, and it's being split amongst uh, the various services. They're all competing for the small uh, target market, and there isn't a lot of profit to be made out of an audience of 250,000 people. But the fact that the internet is not yet pervasive here um, is, is a problem for us, but it is a problem that, that we will get over, it's, it's, and it is a matter of time before um, the internet is, 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 is a more convenient way of ordering something in this country than it is going to your local traditional bookstore or CD store or whatever. Like any business, a successful e-commerce site requires hard work, good customer service and keeping overhead costs down. Open source software provides customizable tools that keep barriers to entry low. Her name is Amanda Joseph, and she is from 7C. She's a system administrator, and she's most welcome in our studio today. Tell me when you first decided that the Geek's Life was for you. I think it was about five years ago when I started as a web developer. Um, basically, at that point, I was using proprietary software, and it was only a couple of years later that I was introduced to OSS um, through my brother. He, he installed Linux on our PC at home and that's how I started getting involved with it. And how did you find the transition? Um, it was difficult at first. I think my, the learning curve happened when I joined 7C Computing um, three years ago. And after being exposed to OSS, um, decided that I needed to change careers and uh, decided for a more technical Linux career instead. Okay, and now you're a system administrator. Ooh, <laughs> what does that mean? That, that basically means that uh, we install Linux servers um, for small businesses. 
um, that look after their business IT functions such as email and internet and antivirus scanning and I basically support that and look after those boxes. Um, how does OSS kind of um, enhance what it is that you do? Well basically being able to you know stick your head under the bonnet and seeing what's actually going on. So you kind of look at the mechanics as opposed to just trying to run the of the surface of the operating system. Absolutely. And you use open source in a business that makes money? Yes. We, we keep meeting people who tell us about how cost effective and how um, adaptable um, you know, the software is. Mm. Um, I mean, why do people buy proprietary software? A lot of people don't know of any alternative. I know that when I was a web developer, I didn't know of any alternative. I thought that you know, Microsoft and, and Windows applications was all that there was available. And I think Creating awareness um, is helping people to realize that you know, there is other stuff out there that they can use that will meet their requirements just as well and will you know, not cost them as much. Great to meet you. Thanks so much for coming in. <laughs> Fantastic. A lot of people have asked us uh, for the entire series on DVD, which is a bit twittish, as we haven't actually finished filming it yet. But never mind, uh, we'll get to in a minute. You should learn to eat with a fork. Um, but go to our website, goopensource.org, uh, you can find out everything, including audio very, ordering your very own DVD set, um, all 13 episodes, uh, and there'll be some more bits and bobs, probably some bonus bits. You might even hear me swearing. Um, Mark Shuttleworth will be doing it after the break. Now, music on your PC is not a new thing. There are many ways of using it and managing it. Check this out from Shutters. All right, all you home DJs, today's your chance because we're doing it with Rhythmbox. Rhythmbox is an open source piece of software that allows you to manage your music collection, allows you to rip your CDs to store them on your computer hard drive and then play them back whenever you're using your computer. Rhythmbox is an integrated music management application originally inspired by Apple's iTunes. It's available for Unix and Linux running the GNOME desktop. Like iTunes, you can use it to browse, search and sort the music on your computer. It supports just about any music format, be it MP3 or Rock Vorbis. Convert your CDs to one of these formats and set up your own playlists. You can even use it to tune into internet radio stations. So all of you now have African rhythm and you have your music on your PC. Set your PC and your music free with free software. Join us again next week when we'll be doing it again. He's got rhythm. Yes, he has old Marky Mark. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Fantastic, give it up like an astronaut. Uh, remember our website if you want to find out more about Rhythmbox, things like where to get it, how to use it, or anything else uh, about it at all, ever. But now for something really hot. Well, it's really hot if you're an accountant, because accountants are crazy. They've got the double entry system. Cash flow is the lifeblood of any business, although keeping control of your debtors, your creditors, your VAT and your income tax can be a nightmare of paperwork. There are software packages out there which can do the job cleanly and efficiently, but they're very expensive. Until now, that is. One of South Africa's most established software packages has now been released as open source. It's called TurboCash. It's a fully integrated accounting software. It fully caters for debtors, creditors, stock control, invoicing, cash book, reconciliations. Uh, it allows you, as far as reporting is concerned, you can run a standard balance sheet, a standard income statement, a standard cash flow report. It fully caters for that. TurboCash is a legacy of 16 years of development in the South African and international environment. It is used mainly by small and medium-sized businesses, although it can be scaled to quite a large organization. There are users out there that have up to seven, eight users using, you know, using TurboCash at the same time. I have people where they do in excess of 200 invoices daily. And then on the other hand, I have other users that do just like one invoice daily. Plugins, some of them developed by other software vendors, provide further functionality, such as internet banking and wide area network support. The company runs training courses and offers various support contracts for a fee. Alternatively, the website lists a host of independent consultants throughout the world. This could happen to you because there's an open source app for almost anything, even how to dress a formerly edgy comedian um, in stripes and browns. So that's wonderful. But go to the website because you can't believe the things that are out there. There are even websites for people who think that the new national party is still new or in fact a party. So I'm going to go this way and jump off the cliff called Former Career, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye. We've talked about e-commerce, and now we're about to make it personal. 
go to www.cafepress.com and be prepared to have your mind blown away. This site allows you to create your own gifts and to use their online retail space to sell your goods. Choose from a wide range of blank products, for instance, a mug. Add your own artwork to the item, moving it around till you're happy with the placing, then add it to your shopping basket. Cafe Press will make the item and ship it wherever you want it to go. And your unique gift stays online. And if it's popular, other people will buy it, earning you a percentage of the sale price. If you're keen to search for likely gift items, browse to the obvious choice, google.com. Let's try something that I'm sure is not unique. We'll search for Google itself. Hmm, a couple of million references to the site. I don't need to say more about it because it is the search engine of choice for millions of internet users. But what if you want your search to be biased towards South African results? Obvious, head for anansi.co.za, South Africa's biggest and best search engine. The most important benefit of using Anansi for your local searches is that it specifically indexes business listings and South African sites. You're likely to find relevant answers without hundreds of confusing dead-end links. To recap, cafepress.com is where you can make gift caps or cups or shirts and start your own online gift nook. Google.com is nowadays the only option when you want to search the web for anything and everything. And anansi.co.za is the search engine of choice for South African only searches. I think I'll go off now and search for world peace. Have you been paying attention? Because if you have, you're about to win some prizes in our competition, which is very exciting. This week, it's really wonderful what you can win because what you can win are a PhotoSmart digital camera and color printer from Hewlett Packard, two DVD writers and a 17 inch flat screen monitor from LG and Soviet clothing vouchers valued a thousand rand a pop. You can win one of those each. The question is quite simple. Loot.co.za, is it A, an online clothing store, B, an online bookstore, or C, an online bank? Please send your answer, just A, B, or C, don't worry about the full answer, uh, plus your name to 34357. Uh, you will be charged two rand an SMS. And the winners of last week's competition are... Johan Fenter wins the 17-inch LG monitor. Eugene Yiga and Wendy Gaylard each receive an LG DVD writer. Roshni Savenundan and Tony Kutsia win a thousand rand Soviet jean vouchers. And Karen Bertha walks away with that HP digital camera and printer bundle. Congratulations! Next week we go to space with NASA. How to Beers Hook? I don't know. And X Planet. We don't literally go to space, so that would take 20 million rand. Who's got that sort of money? So join us if you like that sort of thing. If you don't, well, we're going there anyway. So how's that for, you know, tailoring the program to viewer wants and needs? But you'll love space, really. Come along. Bring some oxygen. Uh, it's a lovely view, but absolutely no atmosphere. We kind of think it was the Russians. Thank you.